This week in the parish of bourses and market structure, Australia threatens chess nationalisation, Zav SPAC a go-go, and it's business as usual at TPI Cap, as another set of results prove very disappointing indeed. My name is Patrick L. Young. Welcome to the Bourse Business Weekly Digest. It's the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast, Episode 94. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very brief reduction of highlights amongst the key headlines from the week in market structure. All the analysis of the week's many events and happenings can be found in Exchange Invest's daily subscriber newsletter, the unique guide to the bourse business, sent daily to your inbox. More details at exchangeinvest.com. This was the week where the CEO of the self styled technology company ASX, Dominic Stevens, tried to demonstrate with some moving averages that his technology outages are declining. The Reserve Bank of Australia hit back through the budget mechanism with a sting in the tail of the Finance Minister's annual address. It amounts to an enormous warning shot across the bows of the self styled technology company, noting that when it comes to ASX and other financial market operators, the Reserve Bank will get new powers to take control of settlement and clearing mechanisms if financial market operators fail. However, the target ASX will doubtless feel an acute element of pressure these days, even though in their own eyes and seasonally adjusted or otherwise smoothed by moving averages, the ASX's technology stack is personification of perfection. Well, at least according to ASX. Will the new ASX chairman, Damien Roach, realise his monopoly has been explicitly threatened? Of course, this doesn't go far enough in allowing Australia to develop its financial centre internationally in the way competition would enable, but it's a deft warning shot from the central bank via the tentacles of the federal treasurer. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, the Zav SPAC is a go-go, with one of those SPAC generic names that sounds like it makes fortune cookies for Chinese restaurants, the World Quantum Growth Acquisition Corporation filed its Form S1 late on a Friday night. In essence, the SPAC concept is made for Xavier Rollet's CV as investment banker turned excellent acquisitive dealmaker. The $300 million targeted probably doesn't place him in the exchange business, but peripherally in fintech, as it ought to give significant clout. Credit Suisse are managing the deal. And the key to this SPAC is not merely in the star power of proven dealmaker Rolle. Past aces include, of course, the likes of FTSE, which at the time nobody liked, but I noted the Financial Times had foolishly held on to their dismal newspaper assets and sold the crown jewels. There was also Russell, the London Clearinghouse, a simply stunning deal which transformed LSEG on many levels, and others. Having learnt the SPAC concept from the similarly cheesily named Golden Falcon, on whose board Xavier sits, Zavspac is coming to market with a really excellent team. Long-term Rolay Lieutenant Serge Harry is on board alongside Antoine Chaguri, who once ran the London Stock Exchange Group Tech Stack. Amongst the NEDs, it's also welcome news that on the board we will see Peter Lenardos, formerly a parish analyst at RBC and also CEO of Sinober, who's joining what looks like a very exciting SPAC project. I wish Zavspac every success, even if it might end up acquiring beyond the pure parish per se. In results this week, it was a busy week for results in the parish. All the deals were in Exchange Invest Daily, the newsletter no person can afford to be without in capital markets and market structure. For the sake of this podcast, some edited highlights. In results this week, TMX of Canada announced a 14% year-on-year increase in their revenue with diluted earnings per share up 37%. Elsewhere, of course, was that sad tale of TPI Cap PLC, the world's largest inter-dealer broker. They reported a 9% fall in first quarter revenue. Another quarter, another set of results which show that TPI Cap is adrift and hemorrhaging value. 
While the stock price is admittedly a fair distance off its recent lows, the company has now gone worse than nowhere for five years. Let's not waste time going over old grounds once again, but just do some simple math. The cost of ICAP, Tullet Prebon completed the £1.28 billion deal on December 30th, 2016. The cost of Liquidnet, the total consideration of the deal finalised on March the 24th this year was $700 million, but the OITP is on the hook for is $525 million, in other words, £375 million, with another £50 million or £36 million to come in three years' time. There is also a possible $125 million performance-related bond. Given the liquid net deal completed at the same time, SIBO announced it was buying Chiax APAC and thus enabling Bids Asia to take flight. Thus, the TPI cap likelihood of reaching the earnout of $125 million can probably be discarded. So, let's do a quick but not overly tough piece of mental math. ICAP cost £1.28 billion. Liquidnet cost £375 million. Liquidnet liability, another £36 million. That leaves us at £1.691 billion. As I speak, the TPI cap market capitalization is no more than £1.738 billion. Now that leaves us essentially with hmm, little more than, gosh, 40 odd million in value in TP as a standalone entity without ICAP and Liquidnet. Maybe having a significant number of legacy, pudgy, middle aged health risks on the books, they're also known as brokers may be regarded as a liability, but there must be some assets on the TP accounts per se, as its market capitalization pre-ICAP acquisition wasn't exactly the rounding error now being suggested by this. Indeed, it was somewhat equivalent to a merger of equals. Thus, we have had this frankly inspired run of value destruction, and don't even start me on the egregious dilution from the liquid related rights issue the other month. In essence, the management, Ahem, strategy, sick, of TPI cap is a parish leader in value destruction. There's only one daily news source for the business of bourses, Exchange Invest, the exchange of information. Exchange Invest publishes the daily digest of everything in the market structure industry around the world in a user-friendly email briefing format from Monday to Friday. With additional pith by former Exchange CEO and long-standing fintech pioneer Patrick L. Young, yes, that's me, Exchange Invest is the unique one-stop shop for the daily news in markets, market operators and related functions. Exchange Invest is available to subscribers at $200 US per user per year or currency equivalent. You can get more details at exchangeinvest.com or email me, patrick at derivativesvision.com. New markets this week. You really needed to be reading the water cooler of markets. Exchange Invest Daily, the board's business newsletter that nobody can afford to be without in capital markets and market structure, as there were lots of exciting new details of markets emerging. From the Middle East, in the highlights for this podcast, discussions are circulating about a new international energy exchange, this time in gas-rich Qatar. After the relative stasis of Dubai Mercantile Exchange for the past 14 years, Perhaps the explosive launch of Murban at IFAD has already spurred a new possible benchmark-seeking marketplace in the Middle East within the first 50 days of the ICE Adnoc Joint Ventures operations in ICE Futures Abu Dhabi. Meanwhile, Dubai Mercantile Exchange issued a public consultation to add the Abu Dhabi Murban crude as an alternative delivery source. Deals this week. Likewise, lots of deals happening. You had to be reading Exchange Invest to get all of the information. Here are the highlights. Euronext managed a double 1.8 billion whammy this week. They launched a successful bond issue, which has been listed on their subsidiary, Euronext Dublin. Very, very low interest rates there. Five-year bonds of 600 million. They had an annual coupon of 0.125%. The 10-year money is 0.75% for the $600 million tranche there. And a third tranche of, yes, you've guessed it, 600 million euros at 20 years with a coupon of 1.5%. Elsewhere, they successfully completed a 1.8 billion euro rights issue. The purchase of Borsa Italiana is funded. 
Meanwhile, ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for some reading, whether you're in lockdown, whether you're waiting to get your vaccine, whether you're possibly even looking at one of those wild, high-flying, hairy buzzer aviation things to go somewhere, whether for a holiday or possibly even a little bit of face-to-face business, you might be looking for some reading. Don't forget, 20 years on from the excitement of the original fintech bestseller, Capital Market Revolution, I wrote the tome Victory or Death, Blockchain, Cryptocurrency and the Fintech World. COVID-19 has proven a killer. Can it kill your career or is that the impact of fintech destroying your business? It's a victory or death world of risk and opportunity. Victory or Death is published by DV Books and is distributed by Ingram Worldwide. While you're waiting for your copy of Victory or Death to arrive, check out our new live stream. Tuesday, 6 p.m. London time, 1 p.m. New York time. It's the IPO video live show. Catch the back episodes on LinkedIn and YouTube. On YouTube, you can find us via IPO-vid. This week, we had a marvellous discussion with the president of ISIS Fixed Income and Data Division, Lynn Martin, touching on ESG, big data, and, well, lots of other topics beside in a very, very rich big data experience. In that scintillating Lynn Martin session, one topic of discussion around ESG data, and indeed the good folks of Lynn's team this week added more ESG reference data. They're now covering the US large cap equity universe. Amongst the fascinating water cooler discussion points to emerge from that report, the average percentage of female board membership for US large cap companies is 27%. Diversity in action, but a long way to go. In crypto land this week, rarely has so much cash and so many egos embarked upon what may prove a fruitless journey. But hubris will out. So they called it Bullish Global. We're nicknaming it Crypto Jiwag. Bullish Global is planning to launch a blockchain-based crypto exchange this year, deploying a decentralized model with the Uniswap-esque concept of customer capital lent to deliver automated market making. A global plutocracy seemed to think they knew the parish better than the legacy practitioners, it seems. In past legacy life, that might have been plausible amongst the parish, and there are certainly a fair few laggards today. But the considerable codification of the exchange world in regulatory terms, amongst others, during the early digital age presupposes precepts like centralization, which don't easily square with decentralization let alone the fundamental conflict being proposed by the bullish folks of interest being posed by an exchange overseeing its own market making, fascinating as the Autobot concept is. I think this happens to look more like bullish market fluff than being able to be, well, bullish on bullish per se, particularly as Gary Gensler's SEC is unlikely to shrug and just say, huh, all decentralized, not our concern. Meanwhile, as this podcast was being recorded, We awaited the first Coinbase results as a publicly traded company. However, if you want to catch up and you're an analyst with what's going on in the world of Coinbase, it's interesting to see that they'll be participating soon in the Barclays Emerging Payments and Fintech Forum. What's interesting here is that Coinbase seemingly aren't invited to be on a platform with the legacy exchanges just yet. Perhaps somebody was asking Coinbase to appear on stage with a handbell shouting unclean, unclean, to differentiate their lightly regulated offering from the higher standards of what one might call proper exchanges. In technology news this week, the Pakistan Stock Exchange has a new unified trading system bought from its shareholder Shenzhen Stock Exchange for $2.85 million, complete with built-in surveillance. Meanwhile, over in Cairo, the EGX launched its new bond trading system, replacing software in use since 2002. Unsurprisingly, the London Stock Exchange Group looks to be targeting a switch to Millennium for its refinitive acquisitions, such as FXL, while Brazil's B3 have been testing an online platform for startup funding rounds. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly. We welcome your feedback. You can contact me directly, patrick at derivativesvision.com, with any comments. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this show, we would welcome you giving us a thumbs up. Or, if you have time, a positive review will always be welcome, wherever you find this podcast. In regulation news this week, IOSCO chairman Ashley Alder didn't have to leave Hong Kong in these Zoom-centric times to deliver a stirring address to the ISDA conference, albeit it wasn't the message the derivatives banks probably wanted to hear, as Ashley lambasted the failures where multiple assets appear to have been, how can I put this, well, little short of hyper-hypothecated to a series of prime broker banks, 
all of whom were left holding the baby when the Archegos hedge funds OTC derivatives of positions imploded. Expect action at the IOSCO level in the near future. In Career Pass this week, we salute Scott Hill, who is retiring from ICE as of this weekend as CFO. His last day at work was Friday the 14th of May. They say life begins at 40, and thus after 14 years with the Intercontinental Exchange in Atlanta, where Scott oversaw no fewer than 40 deals, Scott is leaving the legendary ICE deal machine. All the very best to Scott and wishing him an excellent and propitious retirement. Over at Euronext, they've added several new board members, including former Euro CCP boss Diana Chan. Meanwhile, SIBO have added the former CEO of Turquoise, Nathan Tiefenbrunn, as Senior Vice President and Head of European Equities. Finally, the Pakistan Stock Exchange, fresh from installing that spanking new Chinese technology stack, have elected Dr. Shamshad Akhtar as Chairman. Over in Westminster, London at the House of Parliament this week, the Queen's speech outlined the British government's agenda for the new parliamentary session. Amongst the bills being considered will be an animal sentience bill, which will enshrine in law that animals are aware of their feelings and emotions and can experience joy and pleasure, as well as pain and suffering. Sentience will apply to vertebrate animals, anything with a spinal cord, the Environmental Secretary George Eustace told the British Sunday Telegraph. Rumour has it, investment banks across the City of London are nervously awaiting to discern if this concept of sentience also applies to their graduate trainees. And on that mysterious and magnificent note, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Patrick L. Young, Catch Up Daily in Exchange Invest newsletter, the Daily Bourse Business Update. I look forward to hearing from you next week when we'll be at issue number 95 of the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast. But for now, this is the conclusion to episode 94 of the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much. Once again, my name is Patrick L. Young. Have a great week in life and markets. This show relates to the business of bourses. It is not to be construed as investment advice, nor are we making any investment recommendations. Please consult an investment advisor before you make any investments, and for goodness sake, do your due diligence and do not make investments without complying with the regulations in your home state. Exchange Invest cannot be held responsible for any investment decisions made as a result of our programme, which is for entertainment purposes only. The material herein is copyright Patrick L. Young at the date of publication, while our music and sound effects are sourced from copyright-free sources. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly, the exchange of information.